So, investigating the cardiovascular system. How do you investigate the cardiovascular system? What should be the plan in your mind when you're thinking that this is a patient of cardiovascular system? What broad group of investigation would you be requiring? Please stand up. Yes. ECG. ECG, good. Echocardiography. Echocardiography. Cardiac stress test. Biomarkers. That's it. So when you investigate the cardiovascular system, we use three different set of uh, uh, settings. We need labs, imaging and functional studies. So we go for some lab studies, imaging studies and some functional studies. Now the lab studies, you identify the risk factors. What risk factors are present in this particular patient for developing some sort of ischemic heart disease or cardiovascular disease. You look for the blood sugar, the lipid profile, the protein urea, thyroid disease, homocysteine, complete blood counts. So you need these tests to see if there is a possibility of underlying cardiovascular disease. You understand uh, blood sugar, lipid profile, uh, protein urea, homocysteine, they are all risk factor for coronary artery disease. Now what is this thyroid disease? Patients with hypothyroidism, they tend to have heart disease. Similarly, patients who are hyperthyroid, they can have cardiac problems. And then you see complete blood count. How complete blood count helps you in seeing that this could be a cardiovascular disease? Why? They are indicative of a possible underlying infection in the heart if the clinical scenario suggests. So you may go for these tests to look for that there is a possibility of uh, underlying cardiovascular disease. And then you look for the presence of disease markers. What disease markers are present? You look for the inflammatory markers. For example, this high sensitivity C-reactive protein. It's an indicator of inflammatory disease and uh, it is high in patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So it can be high in atherosclerosis. Similarly, ESR is an inflammatory disorder which is present in, uh, for example, patients who've got uh, heart conditions like endocarditis or those who've got pericarditis, the ESR may be high. And then you've got cardiac biomarkers which may be helpful. For example, myoglobin, creatinine kinase, SGOT, LDH, troponins, the anti-pro-BNP terminal. So they may be useful in finding out that there is ischemic heart disease or heart failure going on. Now we do not use most of these tests. For example, we do not generally use myoglobin or SGOT or LDH. We use creatinine kinase, troponins and in certain situations we need Pro BNP to differentiate that the patient's clinical symptoms of shortness of breath are because of the heart failure or they are because of a respiratory illness. So this uh, N-terminal pro BNP may be useful in those circumstances. Similarly, some of the other markers can be used, but they are not actually the biomarkers, but they are indicators of uh, the presence of uh, possible disease. For example viral markers, the different viruses which produce pericarditis or myocarditis may be identified using for example the Coxsackie viruses. Similarly we can use the AS titers to find out if this is rheumatic fever. So these are different uh, tests which can help, help us to, different, to find out what is the possible etiology of underlying cardiac conditions. So these are the general lab panels we require and in certain circumstances we may need very special type of tests which I have not mentioned uh, in patients who got cardiovascular disease. And then the second group of uh, investigations is the imaging. Now what sort of imaging we use? You see when you uh, answer, you must compose yourself and stratify your answer so that you can give it in a, a very precise way. We go for electrical imaging which is ECG.
ECG and electrophysiological studies. This gives us the electrical image of the heart and this is not the same as morphological image of the heart. So if we see on ECG there is left axis deviation that does not mean that heart has rotated morphologically to the left side. Heart is present in the same anatomical side but the electrical axis has shifted. So we have this electrical image of the heart. We can have ultrasonic images like echocardiography and Doppler imaging. The third one is nuclear imaging. We give uh, nuclear material that gives us an image of the heart. So we can have a nuclear imaging and then we can have radio conventional radiological imaging which may be chest x-ray, CT scanning or maybe conventional catheter studies. We pass in catheters, inject dye and take pictures and see what's going on in the cardiovascular system. And then we got magnetic resonance imaging. This is another technique which has been uh, being used in the recent past with uh, quite a bit of success and it has certain uh, areas in which the sensitivity and the specificity of this imaging technology is quite good. Cardiac and vascular imaging, this can be used for that purpose. So we have these imaging studies and then we've got functional studies. So imaging studies, they give us the uh, morphological appearance of the heart or the electrical appearance of the heart but these functional studies, they give us the information how the heart is performing. So these are basically used. Uh, these studies use the basic investigation. For example, you can see the exercise tolerance test which uses ECG to see how the heart is functioning or we use uh, stress induced echo which tells us how the heart is functioning. Similarly, the catheter studies, the uh, other imaging studies, they can provide us not only structural uh, information about the heart, they can also provide us about the functional uh, capacity of the heart. For example, they can give us how is the coronary flow, what is the cardiac output, uh, what are the valvular structure, what are the different gradients across the valve. So you can get different type of functional information using those uh, basic studies, the imaging studies. So you use different maneuvers to utilize those imaging studies to find out how the heart is functioning. So these are generally the type of investigation we conduct in patients who got cardiovascular disease. Today we are going to discuss one that is the most important. The other investigations uh, we will be doing in the relevant disease sections. For example, when we use the nuclear imaging, for example, uh, in patients who got coronary artery disease or we use catheter studies when we see if we require patients who got valvular heart disease, if we require catheter studies, we will be discussing those studies in the disease sections. Today we are going to discuss ECG. And of the ECG, what is ECG? It's the recording of cardiac electrical events from the surface of the body. We can record from the surface of the heart as well, but that is very difficult and tedious. You have to open the hearts. So we use the uh, recording from the surface of the body. Why we use this recording from the surface of the body? Because it gives us uh, similar information. Why we use it? Why don't we go inside the heart and put electrodes on the on the myocardium and see why we use this? Uh, because the body is uh, an electrolyte solution. You can imagine you got electrolytes and fluids. So the whole body is connected with uh, through this uh, electrolyte solution. And the electrical events which are taking place in the heart, they can be recorded and then they can be amplified and seen on the ECG tracing. So we use this uh, surface recording. There are basics of ECGs. We do the rate, rhythm, access, hypertrophy, ischemia, and certain miscellaneous change in the ECG. We see these one by one, but today we are going to see only the basics, the access, the hypertrophy. And the ischemic changes, the rhythm changes we will see in uh, like tomorrow and day after tomorrow what are dysrhythmias, 
and what are hot blocks so we are going to see this we have a lecture tomorrow on cardiac dysrhythmias and day after tomorrow on hot blocks so we'll see what are the changes on ecg in uh, cardiac dysrhythmias and uh, the hot blocks or various type other blocks now the ECG we use is standard 12 lead ECG. You would have seen the ECG machine by now. Have you seen? So most of you would have seen if you've gone to the emergency or the medical wards, even in surgical wards, you may require ECG of some patients. This is actually created by 10 physical leads. Four are placed on the limbs, six are placed on the chest. And the machine is so designed that this information is converted by the machine into what we require we use one electrode is attached to each limb and six electrodes are attached to the chest the left arm right arm and left leg they are attached to central terminal acting as additional virtual electrode it is present inside the machine and the electrode which is placed on the right lower leg works as an earthing electrode so this is how this machine grossly functions. Now, when you see the limb leads, these are the different directions in which the limb leads are present. You have to remember this because this direct, uh, direction is used in calculating the electrical axis of the heart. Lead one is horizontal between 0 to 180 degrees lead 2 is at 60 degrees lead 3 is at 120 degrees so you can see each lead 1 2 and 3 they are at a distance of 60 degrees from each other it is 1 is 0 2 is 60 3, three is 120 similarly the augmented limb leads they are also placed at 60 degrees from each other you see AVR is minus 30 and you see AVF is minus 90 if you see upwards and here you see AVR minus 50 so they are also placed at a space of 60 degrees from each other so you have to remember particularly remember the lead 1 and lead AVF lead 1 is horizontal lead AVF is totally vertical they are at right angle to each other because we use these two leads to find out what is the electrical axis of the heart there is another complicated mechanism uh, I will just mention it to you that how we calculate exactly the axis but this is the way we calculate the axis we use the lead 1 and lead AVF now these are the chest leads or the precordial leads and I'll see this picture carefully this portion is it doesn't work on the screen this pointer the upper left picture you see an ECG paper and you see a square like structure like this this is called standardization whenever you see an ECG you must see that this standardization is exactly square it's not rounded edges it's got sharp rectangular or right angle edges so if there is a problem in the ECG machine you won't have this sort of clear right angle picture of this box you may have curved ends not the right angle ends so if the ends are curved this is not a standard ECG so whenever you see an ECG you would have seen small boxes in the beginning of ECG so they tell us about the standardization and if there is over damping or under damping it becomes abnormal and it can create artifacts on the ECG so we should see this uh, standardization uh, of the ECG first now how is the ECG paper have you seen ECG paper it's a grid it's got larger boxes which are uh, lined by its, uh, a little solid lines and we've got smaller boxes so each large box contains five small boxes horizontally and as well as five small boxes vertically large squares are 0.2 seconds if you see horizontally they are 0.2 seconds or 200 milliseconds small box would be 40 milliseconds one small large box the height is 0.5 volts two boxes make one volt so 
you understood it because we are going to use this milliseconds more frequently because this uh, segment is this much milliseconds this is this much milliseconds standardization i already have mentioned this you check for the speed and voltage the general speed we use is 25 centimeters per second and the voltage is 1 millivolt we keep it at 1 millivolt sometimes we do it at half millivolts as well because if the complexes are very big and they're going out of the ecg paper we can reduce the amplitude of the volt voltage but standard is one millimeter it means your standardization box which is visible it should be two large squares tall over damping and under damping this is what i mentioned that you have to see the standardization mark if it is there or not over damping means that the stillet of the machine is pressing too hard on the paper that would mean that if the paper is moving and the stillet is moving like that it will create a convex left border this will reduce the height of the r wave in the ecg similarly if it is under damping it will increase the height of the r wave so this produces a problem in the interpretation of the ecg so we have to see standardization if it is there or not then we go for lead placement, limb leads, chest leads, and sometimes we use the right-sided leads, especially if the patient has inferior wall or posterior wall myocardial infarction. We want to see the right ventricle is involved or it's not involved. So we may need right chest leads which are placed as the left leads are placed on the left side, right leads in similar way are placed on the right side. So we need sometimes the right-sided lead, but generally we do not use these right-sided leads. Now these are different waves and different intervals and segments. Now the first is P wave. P wave is a positive wave. It reflects atrial activation. There is current going in the atrium. So this is reflected by P wave. And then there is a small horizontal segment. This is the PR segment. This is because of the delay in the conduction in the AV node because AV node make conduction is slow in the AV node. So we see this isoelectric line and then we have a QRS complex which reflects current going through the ventricle. So this is ventricular activation and then we have got an ST segment which is a complex of uh, repolarization and depolarization going through the ventricle and the T wave is repolarization of the ventricles and we've got an ST segment we've got a QT interval so you have to remember this these three are very important for us the PR interval the QT interval and the ST segment in addition to these complexes so these horizontal lines are very important because the changes in these intervals uh, means a lot uh, to a cardiologist and remember one thing if we place an electrode if the current is moving in the direction of that electrode this will give an upward deflection and if the current is moving in a opposite direction the, the electrode will be giving a negative or a downward deflection for example if there is a lead placed here and the current is moving towards that lead it will give an upward deflection if the current is moving in the other direction it will give a negative deflection clear this thing now how do we calculate rate or on the ecg how do we calculate before we calculate the rate we should see this the rhythm of the ecg is it rhythmic or it is not rhythmic because if the rhythm is irregular it's difficult to calculate so we first see what what is the rhythm distance between same waves of adjacent complexes is similar between any two complexes we take r wave of one complex and we take the r wave of adjacent complex and we see how far they are apart for example say they are two large squares apart and then we take the third and fourth complex they should also be two small two large squares apart if they are 
in rhythm. So if they are not in rhythm, the distance between the R waves will vary. We call it R R variation, which will be present in the ECG. So the similar points on the complexes between two adjacent complexes should be the same for every group of complexes. We take the complexes in the first portion, second portion, third portion of ECG. They should all be equal. So they should be equidistant. Now we calculate, if we see first the rhythm, if the ECG is carrying a rhythm, how to calculate the heart rate or if the ECG is irregular, then how to calculate the heart rate. Now, if the rhythm is regular, we divide 3 by the number of large squares between the peak of two adjacent R waves. We take complex 1, we take its tip of the R wave, we take complex 2, we see the tip of this R wave and we see what is the distance between these two R waves. So number of large squares, we divide 300 by the number of large squares, this gives us the heart rate. So you can see that. If you stop there, if this, there is one large square between two consecutive R waves, the heart rate would be 300. If there are two squares, it will be 150. If there are three squares, it will be 100. If there are four squares, it will be 75. Similarly, it will be 60 if there are 5 or if there are 6 large squares, this will be 50. So this is how we can calculate a heart rate if the patient has regular rhythm. And now you see, uh, quite of uh, our new machines, they calculate the heart rate on its own and you can see on the top of the strip, a heart rate is given. So that may be true in patients who got regular rhythm. When it becomes irregular, the ECG machine also gets confused. At some places it would give 100, at other it will give 120. Depending upon what sort of rhythm is going on when the recording was made by the ECG machine. So this is how we calculate if the rhythm is regular and if the rhythm is irregular, how we calculate it. We take a 10 second strip. How can we take a 10 second strip? One large square is 0.2 seconds. So how many large squares will make one second? Five. And how many large squares will mean? And it may be 50 large squares. So we take 50 large squares and calculate there are how many complexes in that 50 uh, large square strip or 10 second strip. If there are for example 30, we multiply it with 6. It will become 180 in 60 minutes, 60 seconds. So this is how we calculate. You see, you see, you take a 10 centimeter strip, calculate or count the number of QRS complexes, multiply these complexes with 6. You will get the heart rate when the rhythm is irregular. So now you understand how to take heart rate in a regular rhythm or an irregular rhythm. In the regular rhythm, it is the 300 divided by the number of large squares between two adjacent peaks of the R waves. And if the rhythm is irregular, you take a 10 centimeter strips, which means 50 large squares, and you calculate the number of uh, QRS complexes. You multiply this QRS complex number with six. This gives you a heart rate per minute. It's clear? Sure? I don't see people responding from the back. I just you see you nodding. Is it clear or should repeat it again? It's clear, sure. Now we calculate the axis. How do we calculate the axis of the heart? That's what I mentioned. Where is the normal axis of the heart generally? There is a range of axis between normal people that this is from this point to this point. But on average, what is the electrical axis of the heart? It is 59 degrees, which is along the lead 2. Lead 2 is 60 degrees. So the electrical axis on average is 59 degrees. So it's lying almost along the uh, axis of the lead 2. But it can vary between minus 30 to 
90 degrees some of people say that it may go even to 120 degrees so it's between minus 90 to uh, minus 30 to 90 degrees in between any electrical axis is generally normal and on average it lies along 59 degrees the axis actually it represent what does it represent it represents the net or the sum vector the current is moving in this direction and in this direction so we calculate the net vector of this the axis gives actually the net or the sum vector the axis is somewhere between minus 30 to 90 degrees generally it lies along 59 degrees which is limb lead 2 now, this is the quadrantic approach you see on the left there is lead 1 on the top there is lead AVF these two leads are important in calculating the electrical axis now you see if the lead 1 is positive what is positive mean it shows upward deflection and lead AVF shows also an upward deflection if both two are, up, both two are positive the electrical axis is normal if lead 1 is negative and lead AVF is positive this is right axis deviation that is RAD right axis deviation so if lead 1 is negative it's showing a downward complex and AVF is showing an upward complex this is right axis deviation if the lead 1 is positive lead AVF is negative that is lead AVF is downward while lead 1 is upward this is left axis deviation and if both 1 and AVF are downward this is called indeterminate axis or we say the electrical axis lies in the northwest northwest which one is the northwest the gray one is the northwest if both 1 and AVF show that the complex is downward it's negative this means the electrical axis is in the northwest or indeterminate region so this is how we calculate the electrical axis now there is another way of calculating electrical axis it's a little more complicated out of the six limb leads one two three AVF AVL and AVR we see which lead shows the most isoelectric QRS complex isoelectric means the portion of the QRS above the baseline and below the baseline are equal the positive and negative deflections are equal so this is more isoelectric so we take out which lead shows the most isoelectric QRS complex for example lead 1 shows an isoelectric QRS complex so any lead which is lying at 90 degrees to this uh, lead that will be showing the electrical axis of the heart now if the lead 1 is isoelectric and lead AVF is at 90 degrees of lead 1 should we go back to the same old direction picture or do you remember that 1 is at 0 to 180 while AVF is at 90 degrees so if lead 1 is showing isoelectric QRS complex the positive deflection is the same as the negative deflection so the complex above the isoelectric line is same in magnitude as the complex lying below that so this is if this is isoelectric in lead 1 the electrical axis of this patient will be lying along a lead which is at 90 degrees which is lead AVF and now if the AVF is showing a positive deflection this means the electrical axis is downward towards 90 degree and if the AVF is showing a negative complex it means the direction is upward towards the negative side clear this is more difficult so remember the easy one now what is the electrical axis in this ECG you see lead 1 is upward lead AVF is if you see the third line 
the second one is the lead AVF this again is upward so this is the normal QRS axis the lead 1 and lead AVF both are positive so this is a normal electrical axis lead 1 is upward lead AVF is upward as well to use this ECG to calculate the exact electrical axis which I mentioned using the other method it is difficult to calculate because we don't find an isoelectric complex in six limb leads they are all positive so that's why I said this method this is easier the other one is for people who want distinction so they should give an answer this is another way of calculating the electrical axis so if you want to pass this is good enough now we see hypertrophy in atria it's actually the enlargement and distension of the atria more than the uh, actual thickness increase or the hypertrophy in ventricles generally it is the muscular uh, hypertrophy in atria we that's why we call is atrial enlargement now how do we see left atrial enlargement in the ECG atrial enlargement is seen in limb lead 2 sometimes we can also use limb lead, uh, chest lead V1 so we generally use limb lead 2 that gives a better information about the electrical axis or the electrical uh, the hypertrophy or enlargement of the atria now how do we see the left atrial enlargement the P wave is broader than 12 seconds in limb lead 2 it may look like notched it may appear like an M so this is how it appears you can see that P wave is not only broad it is notched so we just take if it is broad if it is more than 120 milliseconds 120 millisecond means three large square three small squares what's the problem I ignored you I just saw look at you I ignored you and then I thought you would have made your way you can take your hand off your mustaches now it's keep it but in here was an m-shaped P wave it's broader than three small squares this is left agent enlargement similarly the right enlargement the lead is taller than three small squares if its height is more than three small squares or more than 120 milliseconds this is right atrial enlargement and you can see that right atrial enlargement in that ECG so this is how we see atrial enlargement left atrial enlargement the P waves are broad while in right atrial enlargement the P waves are tall so the uh, right tall P wave is also called as P mitral P mitral Now we see hypertrophy of the ventricles, left ventricle hypertrophy. There are two ways we see left ventricular hypertrophy. One is we just use the voltage criteria. Voltage criteria we see this is also included in this description. Voltage criteria is if the Q or S wave in lead V1, it means a downward wave in lead V1 is either a Q wave or an S wave. What is a Q wave? It's the first downward deflection. The second downward deflection is an S wave. So if the first downward deflection or second downward deflection we take either it's a Q wave or it's an S wave, we calculate how deep it is. For example, if this is uh, three large squares and we take the upward or the R wave in lead V5 or V6, if it is for example four large squares this will make seven large squares that means how much small squares 35 7 into 5 it is 35 if the sum of these two waves in lead v1 and lead v5 or v6 exceeds 35 millimeters or 35 small squares this is called voltage criteria and indicates left ventricular hypertrophy. We use a more 
precise way in which we have got high sensitivity and specificity. What is sensitivity and specificity? What does sensitivity mean? All sick people will have abnormal test. And what is specificity? All normal people will have a normal test. You understand? This? So we use this. This is more specific test. Voltage criteria is more sensitive, but the criteria we are going to see is more specific for left ventricular hypertrophy. We see if there is left excitation. If lead AVL is more than 11 millimeters tall, more than 11 small squares. If there is left atrial hypertrophy, ventricular activation time is more than 4 milliseconds. Now, what is this ventricular activation time? It's also called intrinsicoid deflection. The ventricular activation time or intrinsicoid deflection, what does it indicate and how we see it? Have you seen ECG? There's an upstroke. In the QRS, the downstroke. So we see if the start of the R wave and the peak of the R wave, the distance between two is more than 40 milliseconds. This is called in increase in intrinsic oil deflection. This is intrinsic oil deflection. The distance between the start of the R wave and the peak of the R wave. This indicates conduction through the ventricle. The more the ventricle becomes thick, the longer it will take. You understand it? So the thicker the ventricle, the longer it will take the impulse to travel. So it means the initial phase of QRS will become, that is, if you don't understand, let me know. I will tell you again. I can tell you 10 times if you don't understand. But don't tell each other if you don't understand anything. So intrinsic or deflection or ventricle activation time is more than the voltage criteria as I mentioned if it is 35 millimeter or more. And then you got STT changes. If there is hypertrophy, there is strain. There may be asymmetrical uh, T wave changes and ST depression. If these are present, we see how much of these are present. Each of this is given a score of 1 while the voltage criteria is given a score of 2. If the net score is more than 3, this is left ventricular hypertrophy and this is very specific criteria. The voltage criteria is sensitive that this may not be very specific. So we use the criteria to see if there is left ventricular hypertrophy. And you can see this is a picture of voltage criteria. You can see V1 here and you can see V6 there. You can add up if it is more than uh, 35, this is left ventricular hypertrophy. Then how do you see right ventricular hypertrophy? R wave greater than 7 mm V1. V generally is downward. It shows a negative complex. But if it has a positive complex, if it is more than 7 small squares, the possibility is that there is right ventricular hypertrophy. Or if the ratio of R to S wave is more than 1, that the R wave is bigger than the S wave, this is possibly a right ventricular hypertrophy. But if this criteria applies when there is no other reason for R wave in V1 there because there are many other reasons in which you can have R wave in V1. As I mentioned, the V1 generally shows a downward complex. But if there is an upward complex, there is a possibility that this patient will have right ventricular hypertrophy provided there are no other reasons for uh, R wave in V1 like Posterior wall myocardial infarction, right bundle branch block, WBW, Wolf Parkinson, White syndrome, type A, lead misplacement, isolated posterior wall hypertrophy, which is seen in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. These are conditions are present. It is difficult to assess that the patient has a right ventricular hypertrophy. If these conditions are not present, the patient possibly has a right ventricular hypertrophy. Is T wave inversion in lead V1 to V3? It indicates severe pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular hypertrophy.
you can see in this EG the T waves are inverted there is ST depression the T waves are not symmetrical they are not symmetrical they are asymmetrical one limb is big the other limb is small so you've got asymmetrical T wave inversion so you can have this in patients very high pulmonary pressure or they've got severe ventricular hypertrophy you can see that and you can see in lead one, V1 there is a big upward wave you see that there is a tall R wave in lead V1 is it visible may not be visible from uh, the and the uh, most important thing we see the ischemia ischemia is the classical ischemia is the elevation of the J point from the ST segment now what is the J point what's the J point this is the end of the QR complex and the start of the ST segment the junction of the QRS complex it may not be necessarily an S wave it may be an R wave as well if there is no S wave so it is the end of the QRS complex and the beginning of the ST segment it's the junction of these two is called the J point then we see when we see ischemia we see ischemia in certain groups of leads if it is present if the findings or changes are present only in one lead this is not significant it has to be present in the group of leads and from these group of leads we can also sometimes find out which artery is at fault for example lead 2 3 avf there are changes ischemic changes in lead 2 3 and avf this is inferior wall infarction and in 90 percent of the time the artery involved is right coronary artery in few cases the left circumflex artery may be involved when the right artery is not dominant left artery is dominant and it's got bigger left circumflex branch which produces inferior wall infarction but if there is inferior wall infarction practically it is the right coronary artery which is involved if there are changes in one and avl these represent lateral wall changes and this is because of the involvement of the left circumflex artery if the changes are in v1 and v2 this is proximal lad this indicates the septal lesion lead v2 v3 v4 this is left anterior descending artery and it is the anterior wall and then you got V5 and V6. This indicates apical changes, and it may be because of the distal left circumflex or right coronary. If the right coronary is dominant and the left artery is small, the right coronary comes from beneath the heart and supplies the apical area. So you may have involvement of the uh, coronary artery as well. You see, there is change in V6 that means possibly the left main stem is knocked out so left main coronary artery may be involved if you've got extensive changes in from lead V1 to V6 this we call anterior extensive infarction so you see you can see from these ECG leads where is the lesion and what is the possible underlying blood vessel which is involved and then in V1 to V3 right coronary artery or left circumflex in wall if there is a reciprocal ST segment depression in these leads this may indicate posterior wall myocardial infarction if there are symmetrical T wave changes in ST depression lead V1, V2, V3 this may indicate a posterior wall myocardial infarction and again or the left circumflex wall Ischemia usually is indicated on the ECG by ST changes in acute through and through infarction, transmural infarction, the ST segment is elevated. In subendocardial infarction, the ST segment is depressed. So if you've got a transmural or through or through infarction, the ST segment is elevated. This is called ST segment or ST elevation myocardial infarction. And if this is not through and through its partial thickness, this is called non-ST elevation MI and there is depression in the ST segment. It can also manifest as changes in the T wave and remote ischemia is shown by Q waves. Remote ischemia means the ischemia which occurred in the past. Q waves do not generally make a fresh ischemia if they are present alone. 
If they are present alone, this means the patient had an event in the past. And this is variable. We cannot exactly tell what is the time when infarction took place. Uh, the clinical event can tell us that at what time the myocardial infarction actually occurred. Now, see, now, what are the components of ischemic ablutis Okay, it indicates dead or infarcted zone. Why do we see Q wave? Q wave is a negative deflection. Why do we see Q wave? If we see, for example, there is a Q wave visible in chest lead 3. Or chest lead 4. The myocardium in front of that lead is dead. It's electrically silent. There is no current in it. So now this ECG will be showing current of the opposite wall. Which will be moving away from this electrode. So that's why it will be showing a negative deflection. Is it clear? The infarcted myocardium is electrically silent. It's a window through which the electrode can see the opposite wall. If you've got a cavity like this, this portion becomes electrically silent. It's dead. It is not showing any current. So the current which is going on in this portion of the wall will be seen by this electrode. And since the current flows from the endocardium to the epicardium, so the current will be flowing in the opposite direction. And the electrode will record a negative deflection because the current is flowing away from that electrode. So the infected myocardium becomes electrically silent. We call it as electrical window and through which we can see the uh, events of the opposite side of the cardiac wall. So you've got a dead zone and then you've got convex ST elevation this elevation of the ST segment, this is an injured area still not dead. This is viable myocardium which can be saved. It reflects ST elevation and this is around the infarcted area. And then you've got T elevation which reflects ischemic area which is not injured as yet. This is around this injured area. So you see three zones when there is uh, occlusion of the RT. There is an infarcted zone. There is an injured zone and there is an ischemic zone. So this is the total complex and which is represented by Q wave, ST segment elevation, T wave inversion. You can see that. There are Q waves, there is ST elevation and there is somewhat T wave inversion. So you can see this is through and through ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Now, what's the diagnosis in this ECG? You see, the elevation can lead to two, three, and AVF. This is inferior wall myocardial infarction. And there's some changes in lead V1, 2, 3. Even in V4, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6 as well. What does that mean? These are called reciprocal changes. And these could be reciprocal changes. These could also indicate ischemia in the region of left main artery. Because if there is right sided myocardial infarction, the cardiac output somewhat is decreased. If the coronary artery, that is the left artery, is compromised, the blood flow through the artery will also be decreased. And this may also reflect some ischemia. So this may be reciprocal change or this may be actual ischemia going on in left main coronary artery. Now, non-ST elevation MI. There is ST depression with symmetrical T wave inversion. ST segment, the J point sags down more than one millimeter. There is symmetrical T versions. There may only be some T wave changes. For example, T wave may become flat or they may be inverted. And two waves may occur. 
So these are very non-specific findings which can all occur in patients not angina. So how to differentiate this is in non-ST elevation MI or this is in angina? If you do cardiac enzymes, the biomarkers of necrosis, they will be positive in infarction, they will be negative in angina. So sometimes we need those biomarkers to differentiate the patient has angina or actually a sub, a sub endocardial infarction has occurred. So see ST segment depressions, in where do you see these ST segment depressions? In lead 2, 3 and AVF. You see ST segment depressions. So this is in ischemia. Some depressions in you see uh, lateral chest leads as well. V3, V4, and V5. Uh, V3, V4, and V5, and V6. There is less in V3, but you see clearly in V4, V5, and V6. So there may be ischemia in these uh, leads as well. So now there is ischemia in inferior leads. There is ischemia in the lateral portion of the chest leads as well. So which artery is involved? Right coronary artery. Inferior wall ST segment depression. Right coronary is dominant. It's also supplying the left side, lateral side. So it's showing ischemia in that region as well. So this ECG indicates this patient has a dominant right coronary artery and there is ischemia in the region of the right coronary artery. Then these clinic changes we will see in uh, particular conditions okay. what are those changes we uh, we omit it here now stress test we use multiple uh, ways of using uh, seeing the stress test what are those ways in which we can have this stress test done what is the classical treadmill or stationary bicycle the other one is we can give pharmacological stress. Yes. Which drug? Dibutamine. Dibutamine causes increased in myocardial wall stiffness. That increases the oxygen requirement. And if there is ischemia, that can be picked on dibutamine testing. So we use phys physical stress or form growth stress. The objectives are to make performance in the situation of physical stress or sometimes even emotional stress. What happens in the physical stress to the performance of the heart? It's carried out on a treadmill or on a stationary skill or use a pharmacological stressor like dubitamine and as you said dipyridamol can also be used. Dipyridamol we use in uh, thallium scanning. What's the, what's the function of this dipyridamol? It's a vasodilator. You see when uh, the coronary artery disease was uh, in the beginning thought of there is uh, spasm or contraction of the blood vessels causing decreased blood supply. We started using dipredamol to cause vasodilatation. We thought that it's going to improve the coronary circulation but we found that it actually causes increase in the infarct size. How does this happen? Because of the steel phenomena, the obstruction generally in coronary artery disease is a fixed obstruction. It's not much of a dynamic obstruction. So the fixed lesion does not dilate. And the other portions of the coronary circulation which are not stenosed, they respond to dipredamol by vasodilatation and the blood is shunted into those dilated area and the blood which is going through that fixed narrowed portion is further decrease causing increase in uh, the infarct size so we stopped giving dipredamol instead we started using nitrates which cause decrease in the venous return so decrease in the size of the LV cavity so we started using those so we can use a pharmacological stress now the indications for stress test is diagnosis and prognosis of cardiovascular disease particularly the coronary artery disease. So we use for both diagnosis and calculating the prognosis. What is the 
expected future of this patient we can use this test uh, the stress test now the treadmill test what are the contraindication for treadmill test within two days of acute myocardial infarction we don't go for a stress test if the patient has unstable angina it's contraindicated what is unstable angina unstable angina is crescendo angina angina at rest post myocardial infarction angina so this is unstable angina we'll see in coronary artery disease what are different types of anginas patient has severe symptomatic aortic stenosis or patient has uncontrolled symptomatic heart failure these are contraindications if the patient has hypothermia like, embolism or there is or if the patient has myocarditis pericarditis or aortic section these are absolute contraindication that if these conditions are present we do not go for the uh, stress testing on treadmill there are some relevant contraindication for example that left main coronary stem is involved Moderate stenotic pillar heart is any valve, aortic valve or valve if there is or pulmonary valve if it is stenotic, it's the red contraction, electrolyte abnormalities, electrocalemia, hypokalemia, hypertension. Much depth not available for this, but we see the systolic pressure is more than 200 or diastolic pressure is more than 110. Should not conduct an exercise tolerance test because if the patient has a hypertensive response on EDT, the blood pressure is going to rise further and may cause damage. For example, it may cause cerebral hemorrhage or it may precipitate heart failure. If there are tachyarrhythmia, if the patient has epic cardiomyopathy which is causing outlet obstruction or any other reason for outlet obstruction mental and physical impairment leading to uh, inadequate capacity to exercise for example if the patient has knee joint disease or backache or something like that for example there is a neurological condition patient has a stroke cannot do a treadmill testing so this is contraindicated if there is high degree atrioventricular block this is contraindicated. Now, what are the indications for terminating the test when you should stop the test? You know the uh, protocol which is used in uh, the conventional treadmill test? We call it Bruce protocol. In Bruce protocol, after every three minutes, the speed of the treadmill changes, it increases and the slope of the uh, t, uh, this treadmill increases. So we've got the multiple stages and the machine automatically changes and when the patient deter, uh, deter, uh, develops some features we have to stop that treadmill and we uh, decide on it whether this is a uh, stress test is positive or not positive so what are those indications when we ask to stop the treadmill and terminate the test the absolute contraindication are if there is drop in systolic blood pressure of 10 meters or more of the baseline, despite an increase in the workload when this is accompanied by other evidence of ischemia. If the patient has, for example, evidence of angina and the blood pressure falls by 10 millimeter, stop the treadmill. If the patient develops moderate severe angina during a treadmill, patient starts complaining chest pain stop the test. There is increased nervous system for example if the patient develops ataxia, dizziness or syncope the test should be stopped. Signs of poor perfusion for example patient develops pallor and or the patient develops cyanosis you should consider that this is underlying ischemic heart disease so it's a sign of poor perfusion. Technical difficulties monitoring the electrographic tracing. If there is a lot of baseline variation, we cannot actually see the electrical tracing clearly. Or the pressure cannot be monitored. The patient is too shaky. The blood pressure cuff is tied to the patient's hand. It's being continuously monitored. If the patient is too shaky, the EC tracings are not readable and the blood pressure cannot be recorded properly. This should be stopped. Subject says, I feel uncomfortable, stop it. If there is sustained ventricular tachycardia, stop it. If there is ST elevation more than one millimeter in leads without executes, uh, that is other than lead V1 and lead AVR. If there is any ST segment elevation in leads other than lead V1 and AVR, 
stop the test. This is a positive test indicating there is ischemia. And then the relative trending of the test. For example, there is drop in systolic blood pressure of 10 millimeter, but there is no absence, no presence of ischemia or any other evidence of ischemia present. Blood pressure drops, but the evidence of ischemia is not present. The absolute ind indication of stopping was the blood pressure drops by 10 millimeter, and there is evidence of ischemia elsewhere. ST is such as excessive expression, horizontal or down stopping ST segment depression two finger, or there is blocked axis shift. The axis suddenly shifts from the normal to the left. <coughs> Should stop this test. Then ventricular technical include multiple multiple premature VCs, triplex VCs occurring at sequence. Tachycardia, there is block or bradyarrhythmia. If it has fatigue, shortened breath, wheezing, cramps, or medication, stop the test. Development of bundle branch block or intraventricular conduction defects, which cannot be distinguished from ventricular tachycardia. If there is tachycardia, bundle branch block, which is difficult to differentiate from uh, the ventricular tachycardia, stop the test. If there is in chest pain and if there is hypertensive response, the blood pressure goes above 250 or a diastolic goes above 115, stop the test if the patient has hypertensive response. So stop this test. So these are reasons when the test should be stopped. Now, interpretation of the test. Interpretation is always done in the context of exercise capacity of the patient changes. If the blood pressure drops, it's a very strong indicator the patient has coronary artery disease. If the blood pressure shoots up, then there is a possibility that the patient has underlying heart disease. So you consider both the hemodynamic response, the clinical response of the patient, and we see the ECG. This is a horizontal one small square up, then this patient has problem, ST segment depression. We got estimate elevation, this is clear, the patient has ischemia. If there is slope ST segment that was down sloping ST segment depression in the first picture. In the third picture, it is up sloping ST segment depression, it is depressing like this. In that, it is depressing like this down sloping ST segment, this is up sloping ST segment depression. Now, what is the calculation? How do we calculate that this is significant depression? In a down sloping ST segment depression, if the J point drops by one small square, this is significant. One small square or more than that. But in patients who got up sloping ST segment depression that is ST segment is like this it's not like this so we see from the J point if the depression is more than or equal to 2 millisecond uh, 2, uh, 2 millimeters that is two small squares 80 milliseconds from the J point what is the J point end of QRS complex if from this point we go on the ST segment to further small squares and if at that point the up sloping ST segment is depressed by two small squares or more than two small squares this is significant where in case of down sloping it's the depression of the J point by one small square but if it is an up sloping ST segment it has to be two small squares, two or 80 milliseconds away from the J point. Is it clear? This is a little confusing thing. At the back, you understand it? Some of you are sleeping as if you are dead. The one was right there in the back. Another one I saw here was sleeping. He's just dead. You have to call uh, Sura Israfi to wake him up. And then appearance of an inverted U wave. 
This is significant. If the U wave is inverted, this is significant. So this is about the treadmill test and we stop here. Tomorrow we will discuss arrhythmias, the tech arrhythmias and bread arrhythmias and day after tomorrow we are going to discuss the hot blocks.